Our philosophy at New Scientist is this. Science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. Um, I actually quoted Johan Hari, the British journalist, who says, I respect you too much to respect your ridiculous beliefs. Hmm. And that's not a bad way of putting that's it. That's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I actually, I actually thought of modifying that to, I respect you too much to believe that you could possibly hold such ridiculous beliefs. <laughs> yes. um, and if you, if you seriously call yourself a Roman Catholic, Will you please either defend that belief in transubstantiation and explain why it's not ridiculous, or else admit that you're not really a Roman Catholic at all? Yes. You can't have it both ways. But religion's a pretty good one, because religion means faith, and faith means believing something without evidence. And if you believe something without evidence, and you've been brought up to think that belief without evidence is somehow supremely virtuous, and you don't have to justify your belief, you just say, that's my faith, don't question it. That's a recipe for danger. Decency and honesty and truth come from philosophy, they come from law, they come from um, love of people, they come from the golden rule, do as you would be done by. There are all sorts of good sources for decency and truth. Uh, religion is actually not one of them. If you think about where we'd be if we followed the, mor the morals of the Bible, we would be, if a husband was discovered that his wife was not a virgin on their wedding night, he would have to stone her to death. Um, he would stone people to death if they break the Sabbath, if they worship graven images. We as a matter of, now of course, modern theologians have none of that. I'm not saying that they do, and that is indeed my entire point. We do not, none of us, take our morals from scripture. We take our morals from something else. To the extent that we take them from scripture, we cherry pick. We choose the nice verses from the Bible, we reject the nasty verses. The criterion by which we cherry pick is available to all of us, whether we are religious or not. It, well, comfort is a fine thing, and there are all sorts of sources of comfort. But because something is comforting, it doesn't make it true. And I care passionately about what's true. If somebody comes to me and says, I don't care what's true, I want comfort, then that's fine. They go away and get their comfort. But if somebody is genuinely interested in what's true, then I think they need to look to science. They need to look for evidence. A doctor can comfort you by saying you haven't got cancer when you have. Some people like that sort of comfort, other people would rather hear the truth. One well, of the story from Blackburn where Jack Straw, the uh, yes. former foreign secretary, had asked uh, women to consider taking off their veils, Muslim women, uh, when they came to his surgery. I'm, I'm intrigued, given your perspective on this, what do you thought of that? Jack Straw never said they must take off their no. veils. He simply invited them to consider taking off their veils, which is an entirely reasonable thing to do. And they could say no, or they could say yes. His point was that humans, and this is an undeniable point, that humans use their face in communication. You can really see that. That's why it's better to go and see your MP rather than telephone him, because you can each see each other's face. It defeats the object if you cover up almost all of your face. But he never said you must take your veil off. He simply said consider it. But, but interesting that even in asking them merely to consider, it caused that fraud, didn't it? Well, isn't now, that interesting? Now, what do you make of that? Well, uh, I mean, it seems to me to show an, a, a, an almost ludicrous hyper sensitivity. He didn't tell them to take their, their veils off. It's a kind of almost hysterical reaction to something that he didn't say. And, and Christians with some, some relish sort of say, well, you don't go after Islam, do you? Yeah. Um, and I think we need to discuss that because uh, it's true that um, the, the threat of having your head cut off um, is somewhat of a deterrent. And um, courage is a virtue, but there are limits. And um, I, I've prepared what I think is a reasonable response, which, which I would give if I were, say, I don't know, an editor of a newspaper accused of not printing uh, a, a cartoon of, of Mohammed. Um, I think I would say something like this. I may give in to your demand for censorship, because I fear your barbarism. <laughs> but don't for one moment confuse that with respect. I don't respect you, I despise you. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, here we have a God who wanted to forgive mankind its sins, including, by the way, the sin of Adam, who he presumably knew perfectly well never existed. Nevertheless, he wanted to forgive mankind's sins. Why didn't he just forgive them? Why was it necessary to have a human sacrifice to have his son tortured and executed in order that the sins of mankind should be absolved. Is that not the most disgusting <laughs> idea you ever heard? I have heard experienced nurses who've worked all their lives in old people's homes say that the ones who are most terrified of death tend to be the Roman Catholics. <laughs> all that guilt fed from the cradle up and the terror of purgatory and hell. As for eternal nothingness, it's, is it really all that frightening? As Mark Twain said, I do not fear death. I'd been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and had not suffered the slightest inconvenience. From <laughs> I want to end by reading the opening lines of a previous book of mine, Unweaving the Rainbow. These are lines that I've long earmarked for my own funeral. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Sahara. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively outnumbers the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I in our ordinariness that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds, how dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred. Thank you very much. You can find good quotations in the Bible to support the point of view that you want to, uh, to, ad to adopt. And of course you can find the exact opposite. So why not bypass the Bible altogether as a, as a source of uh, Moral. authority and simply say, as Shakespeare said, as Milton said, as Anybody you like, you can quote anybody in literature you like, and as Isaiah said, or as Jesus said, you can get quotations from literature all over the place to bolster the point of view that you want to make. That's what Martin Luther King did, and many other people have done from the Bible. You can get it from Shakespeare, uh, you can get it from Milton, as I say, you can get it from, from Aldous Huxley, you can Dickens. Get from all sorts of people. Dickens. Um, the Bible should not be given the privileged status. We shouldn't be discussing here, is the Bible relevant today? We should be discussing, is literature generally relevant? Absolutely. I'll try a, a, a short poem by W.B. Yeats, who was very much not a scientist. He was, he was a mystic. Uh, but this, to me, um, carries a sort of message of scientific wonder. Be you still, be you still, trembling heart. Remember the wisdom out of the old days. Him who trembles before the flame and the flood and the winds that blow through the starry ways. Let the starry winds and the flame and the flood cover over and hide, for he has no part with the lonely, majestical multitude. So I don't understand why you don't find that convincing. Well, I, let me tell you what, what happened in my brain at that particular right. moment in time was that I was thinking of the book of Genesis and where uh, God says that he made everything according to its kind and that it was, uh, and, and we stayed within those groups in, and we didn't evolve. So I, I find it difficult. And because, let me get this, this right, because what, what you're saying is that the book of Genesis it takes precedence over science. You're saying that a book that was written when, about 800 BC, um, uh, written by whom? Um, by some scribe uh, uh, during the Babylonian captivity. Um, wh why would no, you it believe? Goes back, it goes back 
further than that, and certainly would, most scholars, Bible scholars have attributed the book of Genesis to uh, Moses. Oh, really? To yes. Moses? Yes. But, uh, Bible scholars attribute it to Moses. I, I, I know so. you attribute it to Moses, yes. but yes. can you name a Bible scholar who attributes it to Moses? I can't at this moment no. in time, okay. just off the top of my head, but okay. that doesn't stop me believing in God. Have well, you read the Quran all the way through? No, but about a quarter of the way through at the right. moment. So wh why would you read the Bible rather than the Quran? It's just the way that um, I, ended, I, st I started to be introduced to the Bible. Yes, but if you had it. read the Quran, maybe you'd be a Muslim. Possibly. Mm. But, so doesn't uh, that shake your confidence a bit? Not at all, because of what I'm going to, going to try okay. and explain to you. Right. I mean, scientists are not impressed by anecdotes. Um, if you could get a scientist to measure the, the, I don't know, your galvanic skin response, you might get some sort of scientific interest in that. But it really, I mean, there are thousands of stories all over the world. People have ghost stories. People have stories of demonic possession, all different religions. Um, they're just not impressive, I'm afraid, to a scientist. And in particular, what I'd like to concentrate on is why, even if the, these experiences happen to you, why on earth would that make you believe in the book of Genesis, given that all the scientific evidence is against it, given that the Archbishop of Canterbury is against it, given that the Pope is against it, given that any respectable bishop is against it? Why would you go from having electrical tingling down your back to saying that the book of Genesis has got to be true. Mm. Why tie it to the book of Genesis? All right. I'm intrigued by the extraordinary luck of um, the, the happenstance that gives rise to each one of us and to uh, really everything in the world. Um, I've dramatized this by saying, what if a particular dinosaur had sneezed at a particular moment um, and thereby changed whether or not it caught. You know, if, it, if it hadn't sneezed, it was just about to eat a little shrew-like animal, which was to be the ancestor of all the mammals. There was such an animal. There was one individual shrew-like mammal, which was the ancestor of all modern mammals. This dinosaur was about to eat it when it sneezed, and so the little shrew-like animal got, a, got away. So, the, not only our lives, but the, 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 but the existence of all the mammals hangs on that sneeze. Now, of course, I don't know that that particular story is true, but I'm absolutely sure that some similar story uh, is true. Not just one such story, but many, many stories. Um, all of us owe our existence to the happenstance of one particular sperm hitting one particular egg at a particular day not only in our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation, our great-grandparents' generation. Um, Aldous Huxley said, a million million spermatozoa, all of them alive, out of their cataclysm but one poor Noah dare hope to survive. And of that billion minus one might have chanced to be Shakespeare, another Newton, a new Dunn, but the one was me. <laughs> Shame to have ousted your betters thus, taking ark while the others remained outside. Better for all of us, Froa Homunculus, if you'd quietly died. Because that's not the way science works. We don't say, this is a very difficult case, therefore God must have done it. Therefore, science can't explain it. Therefore, the supernatural must be wheeled in to explain it. That isn't the way we work. If science can't explain it, then we say, all right then, let's go to work. Let's see what we need to do, what new theories we need to bring into our science, how we need to change our science. Um, and uh, that technique has always worked so far. If there was something that I was genuinely puzzled about, then my response would not be, oh, it must be supernatural. My response would be, then in that case, we must roll our sleeves up and go to work to try to understand it. Any guess on when the president won't be obligated to end major speeches with, and God bless the United States of America? <laughs> I suspect that President Obama is an atheist. <laughs> the, the, the interesting question, and, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if Presidents Clinton and Kennedy were as well. Um, it wouldn't, uh, but the, 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 the interesting question then is when will they dare to say so? When will a president dare to say so? And my suspicion is that 
there may be a certain amount of emperor's new clothes going on here, and it's, it's a sort of it's widely believed that you cannot get elected in the United States unless you say, "In God we trust," whatever it is, that God bless America. Um, maybe it's just not true. I mean, maybe maybe nobody's tried it, uh, and. Um, uh, maybe we should all be, not we, I can't speak for you, maybe you should all be writing to your congressman saying, um, you don't just have to suck up to the Catholic lobby and the this lobby and the that lobby and so on. What about the atheist lobby? We exist. We're actually quite numerous. Um, so don't take us for granted. And maybe that'll come soon. When uh when there was the second exodus from Africa into, into Asia, they spread to Australia, to North America, and thence to South America over the Bering Strait, um, to the Arctic, all over the world, uh, Homo sapiens spread. And in a rather short space of time, they diverged into what we recognize as different geographical races. Um, despite the, what we see as the uh, differences between human races, we are a remarkably uniform species, genetically speaking. Uh, it looks as though we passed through a genetic bottleneck, maybe between 70 and 80,000 years ago, uh, which means that we are, um, we haven't had very much time to diverge since then. The divergence that we, we see in this form of skin color and, and uh, other racial identifying features seem to be rather superficial. Genetically speaking, we are a very uniform species. It's been said that if you pick out any two chimpanzees at random in, in, in Africa, they are more different from each other genetically than any two humans any, anywhere around the world. Um, so we are rather, rather uniform, but we, um, we, we appear to be very, very different. And our skin color can be very different. Our hair, hair form can be very different, and so on. Um, I think we probably do need to have some kind of an explanation for why we have these differences in superficial appearance, uh, whereas most of our genes are remarkably uniform. And once again, my mind tends to turn to sexual selection on this matter, uh, as, as actually Darwin's did as well in, in The Descent of Man. Um, so it could be that um, the superficial differences between us have, have something to do with sexual selection. Skin color certainly has something to do with um, with the sun and the fact that um, w where there is rather little sun, uh, as in high latitudes, you need to lose your dark pigmentation in order to get enough, um, well, vitamin D and, and you, need, you actually need sunlight, whereas sunlight can be bad for you, skin cancer and so on. And so in, in tropical countries um, where, you, where you are exposed to a lot of sun, you tend to need a lot of melanin to um, protect from sunlight. So there's undoubtedly some sort of environmental difference um, between, the, between the races. Um, as for why, you, you asked about why, why we're so obsessed with, with, with race. Um, this is coming onto the field of psychology, which is again Stephen Pinker's field more than mine. But um, I think there is psychological evidence that humans form kind of in-group, out-group barriers. And if they can find any kind of superficial cue, label, with which to identify the in-group and distinguish it from the out-group, they tend to use that label. There have even, I believe, been experiments taking children and uh, get, dressing half of them up in, I don't know, green t-shirts and half in orange t-shirts, and they sort of form into green gangs and orange gangs, and, and under some circumstances, there can even be some hostility between these gangs, which are arbitrarily selected, arbitrarily chosen, and given these superficial barriers. Um, I, I chose green and orange advisedly, by the way. Um, if you think about the Irish situation, <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you divide people by some arbitrary label, and you call half of them orange and half of them green, and um, you then make a rule that oranges only ever marry oranges, greens only ever marry greens, and orange children only ever go to orange schools, and their children go to orange schools, and their grandchildren go to orange schools, and green children go to green schools, and their grandchildren go to green schools. You carry that on for 300 years. And what have you got, Northern Ireland? <laughs> um, well, orange t-shirts and green t-shirts is a sort of 
frivolous example. Skin color is less frivolous. Um, and uh, so it may be that, that that's partly the answer. But I think the point to hammer home is that, is that the genetic and the evolutionary evidence shows that we are an extremely uniform, uh, uniform species. Um, uh, my foundation has a t-shirt that says, we are all Africans. Great, thank you. I mean, you, you are uh, proudly and avowedly atheist. Yeah, aren't you? Why is it important? I'm the, I'm the interviewer, not the... <laughs> Why is it important, you believe, to have this argument? Because a lot of people would say that uh, in some form, religion is a philosophical comfort to people, so why? why? Uh, yes, I mean, philosophical comfort, of course, doesn't make it true. The reason I interjected Aunt You is that I get a bit fed up with being wheeled out as the atheist, when actually most of the intelligent people you meet are atheists, and I suspect right, you are too. Right, you're wooing me in, I see. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It, it, no, but why is it important to destroy, in your view, to... to well, to, to, to it's not important to destroy story. anything, but it, but it is important to get at the truth. And so uh, if you don't want to know the truth, if, you're, if your comfort zone forbids you to, 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 to enter what's yeah. true, then by all means say, I don't, wish, I don't wish to know. If you do wish to know the truth, then... then... Because what, uh, there is, as you know, at the moment, uh, a scientific school which says that the religious impulse is actually something in our DNA. Oh, I believe that. Uh, uh, but that, that, that again... Well, gall gallibility is part that, of our that, DNA. That, yeah, that doesn't make it true, of course. Yeah. And, uh, but might it make it necessary to have that sort well, of... Well, not exactly necessary, because plenty of people manage to do without it. But it's, it is certainly possible that it does give psych psychological comfort. It gives the reverse as well. I mean, if you look at people who are afraid of dying, if you, if you look at sort of the most hospitals... People you'll find that many of the people who are the most afraid of dying are those who think they're going to hell or, or think that they, that they might. But in the end, if you follow through your belief, is it all pointless ultimately? Well, it's ultimately pointless in the sense that there is no purpose that the universe has for us. I mean, we happen, we've come into the universe. But all the more reason to give ourselves a personal purpose, which we can do, and we all, of course, do, and um, I and probably you do have very strong guiding purposes in our in our lives and that gives us great comfort great solace great cheer mm. uh, and it doesn't matter that the universe has no ultimate purpose make your life purposeful while you've got it and but science directly doesn't help us with that or... well except the pursuit of it obviously. the pursuit of it is clearly a very constructive a very, a very wonderful thing to do I mean it, to, to understand why you're here is a is a very beautiful thing and and it gives my life enormous meaning and purpose for stalking thank you very much thank for you very much. Um, we are going to die and that makes us the lucky ones most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born uh, the number of possible ways in which DNA could uh, permute to make to make people is I think I said it was greater than the number of sand grains in in Arabia or something like that um, there is an enormous potential for people who could have been here in our place. So we are deliriously lucky to be here. Uh, so make the most of it. <laughs> How do you think now uh, that the world actually began? Oh, uh, the world began, the Earth began, by condensing out of a disk of gas. The sun and all the planets were a disk of gas. They condensed at about 4.6 4 billion years ago. And the sun became the great bulk of the, of the disk. The great bulk of the disk became the sun. And then the planets were spinning around. That's how the world began. The universe began rather longer ago, about uh, 13 or 14 billion years ago. And how that happened is more problematical. F physicists are working on that. As for life, which is my subject, well, that didn't start till uh, uh, three point something billion years ago and has been evolving ever since. That's fascinating. At the age of nine, I, w I wouldn't say that I was an atheist. I'd say that I just became aware that there were lots of different religions and they couldn't all be right, uh, which is a bit different from being atheist. What is the most important piece of evidence for that? Evolution well, is a fact. Okay. Um, there's lots and lots of different kinds of evidence. It all kind of piles up. Um, fossils... I've, used to be the most important evidence. I think they've rather been eclipsed now by molecular genetics. If you um, compare the genes of any animal you like, any plant you like, they've all got the same genetic code, which is amazing for a start. That means that you can actually read the genes of every living creature, and you can actually compare what's clearly the same gene 
in a human and an oak tree or a human and a kangaroo. And you can compare the differences. So the, the same gene, they've got they're telling the same story, but each letter, maybe, you know, one in ten letters is different, or one in twenty letters is different. So the, the sheer amount of detail in which we resemble all living creatures is overwhelming. And you can, by looking at different genes, you can show that we are most similar to chimpanzees, a bit less similar to monkeys, a bit less similar to rats, a bit less similar to fish, and so on. The whole thing falls on a beautiful hierarchical tree, which has to be a, a, f a family tree. Um, death, non-random death before reproduction, is what natural selection is all about, and it's tragic. And, and the, the, if, if, if one looks around the world and sees the sheer amount of suffering that there is in the animal kingdom, as well as, the, as it is in, the, in, in the human, um, it, it, it is exactly as you would expect it to be if it were just the blind forces of, na of nature acting, if, if there were no um, overarching purpose in the, in the world. It's one of the strongest points one can make, and Darwin himself said it, uh, that I find it impossible to believe in um, something like, believe that the, the ichneumonidae, that's a family of wasps who torture their victims in horrible ways, um, could, be, could be created by a beneficent deity, some, something like, like that. Um, it's, it's utterly foreign to the scientific way of thinking to say, oh, isn't, isn't the world terrible? Shouldn't, shouldn't evolution do something about it? It's because it's terrible that evolution produces the results that it does. Abraham Lincoln, too, uh, like Huxley, was ahead of his time, but his views on matters of race also sound equally backward to us. Here he is in 1858. I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, that I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. And inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. My point is that if Huxley and Lincoln had been born and educated in our time, they would have been the first to cringe with the rest of us at their own Victorian sentiments and unctuous tone. I quote them to illustrate how the moral zeitgeist moves on, even in such a short time. Something has shifted in the intervening decades, and it's shifted in all of us. The shift has no connection with religion. If anything, it happens in spite of religion, not because of it. People think that they get their moral standards, moral values from scripture. It's perfectly clear, and many people have made this point, that they do it by cherry picking. They go through the Bible picking out those verses that conform to the current standard of morality as the, the position that it's reached in the shifting moral zeitgeist. And they reject those verses, which in the case of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Exodus, etc., is most of them. They reject those. But in order to do that cherry picking, in order to do that selection and rejecting of nice verses versus nasty verses, they have to have a standard, and that standard is available to all of us, whether we're religious or not. And the, the shifting moral zeitgeist is a particularly telling illustration of how indeed it is available to all of us. It even shifts in parallel in all of us, whether we are uh, religious or not. Ion Hersey Ali, who some of you may know of, who herself escaped from Islam in Somalia, became a member of parliament in the Netherlands, and then and now lives here under, under armed guard. Um, she is deeply worried that, that America is, and, and the West generally, are sleepwalking in the face of the danger from militant Islam. It's, of course, ex expressed in its ex most extreme form that we've yet seen in the form of ISIS at the present in Syria and Iraq. Uh, and I think just about everybody has been horrified by seeing the pictures of people being beheaded and people being 
stoned to death for. The crime of being raped, imagine that. Um, the crime of uh, being seen out, of a woman being seen out and about without a male relative to accompany her. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, women aren't allowed to drive. Um, gay people are persecuted and sometimes executed for being gay. Um, this is orders of magnitude more horrible than anything that we see in the, in the West. And yet, my kind of people, decent, soft-hearted, liberal people, almost seem to be bending over backwards to be apologists for this kind of thing. It's almost as though we're saying something deeply patronizing and condescending, which is, of course, we here in the West don't do that kind of thing, but it's their culture. It's a kind of looking down on, on people with brown skin, condescending to them. It's a form of bigotry against them to say they, should be, they shouldn't be held to the same standard as we would, as, as, as we would in, the, in this country. So I, I am deeply offended by the uh, tendency of nice liberal people who I regard as my kind of person to bend over backwards to excuse the horrific things which are done to women in Islamic theocracies uh, and, um, as it were, make, make light of them. Rather consistently refer to God as a male. Well, I, that's a perfectly fair point, uh, and um, I, um, I mean, to, to me, to me there, there is no difference between a non-existent male and a non-existent <laughs> female. <laughs> to the extent that God or gods has sociological, psychological, political significance, then I could easily imagine that um, if one could somehow begin a cult of a female god, it might well have a very improving effect upon human society. Uh, what is your opinion on same-sex marriage, and is it against the evolution principle? I don't care what's against the evolution principle. I'm, I'm all for, for going against the evolution principle. Um, Evolution, by natural selection, is the explanation for why we exist. It is not something to guide our lives in our own society. If we were to be guided by the evolution principle, then we would be living in a kind of ultra-Thatcherite, Reaganite um, <laughs> society. Um, Study your Darwinism for two reasons, because it explains why you're here, and, for the, and the second reason is study your Darwinism in order to learn what to avoid in setting up society. What we need is a truly anti-Darwinian society. Anti-Darwinian in the sense that we do, do not wish to live in a society where the weakest go to the wall, where the strongest suppress the weak, even kill the weak. Um, we do not, I at least, do not wish to live in that kind of society. I want to live in a sort of society where we take care of the sick, uh, where we take care of the weak, take care of the oppressed, which is a very anti-Darwinian society. So... <laughs> scientists that I respect are scientists who work hard to be understood, to use language clearly, to use words correctly, and to understand what is going on. We have been subjected to a kind of word salad of scientific jargon used out of context with in inappropriately, apparently uncomprehendingly. I have experienced plenty of things which could be called transcendental. I've experienced the feeling of almost mystical wonder that I get when I look up at the stars, look up at the 
Milky Way, uh, contemplate the galaxies receding from us, listen to a Schubert quintet, uh, read a sonnet of Shakespeare. These are all things which only a human mind is capable of doing. So may I ask you? Let, 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 okay, sorry. Only a human mind is capable of doing that. And a human mind is capable of doing those things because the human mind has been put together in the brain put. as a highly complicated organization that has evolved over some four billion years of evolution, putting together nervous systems. It is a stunning achievement of evolution to have put together the human brain, the human brain that is capable of being moved by such things. I yield to no one in my capacity to be moved by what you call the, the transcendental. What I do not do, however, is to indulge in mystical nonsense about it being there before there were brains or the equivalent of brains. Why shouldn't you offend people? I mean, of... yeah. I mean, on my recent, on my previous visit to this country, I was in Florida just a few months ago, and a teacher there told me a story. I try and remember it. I hope I don't get the details wrong. Um, she was a teacher of biology, and she was teaching evolution, as she should. It's a central theorem of biology. And one... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, why is that funny? This is the United States. Sorry? <laughs> um, uh, you, you, you cannot teach biology without evolution. It's, it's, it, it pervades the entire subject. So this teacher was doing that. One student complained to her parents that, her, that she, was, uh, she was offended by having evolution taught. Uh, in, 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 this, in her school class. The parents claimed, uh, the, the parents went and complained to the head teacher of the school, who summoned the biology teacher and dressed her down, scolded her for offending this child, ordered her not to teach evolution anymore, even though this was only one child in I don't know how many in the, in the class. That meant that all the other children were deprived of a proper education simply because one child of ignorant, bigoted parents had complained to the school and the head teacher, an obvious coward, had capitulated to this uh, really ap appalling state of affairs. Fortunately, the biology teacher herself was uh, a teacher of initiative and she went to the nearest university and invited a professor to come and teach evolution. Since he was not employed by the school... Um... <laughs> the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. <laughs> Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, better read, was of a similar opinion. The Christian God is a being of terrific character, cruel, vindictive, capricious and unjust. Any creative intelligence of sufficient complexity to design anything comes into existence only as the end product of an extended process of gradual evolution. Creative intelligences being evolved necessarily arrive late in the universe and therefore cannot be responsible for designing it. God, in the sense defined, is a delusion. It's tragic, I think, that uh, the ethical discussion, ethical discourse that we need to have in society has for centuries been hijacked by religion, by, a, by what amounts to a pseudo-scientific worldview, has absolutely nothing to do with entitlement to talk about ethics. Um, so we need to, one way in which I put it, I think I put it like this in the Melbourne Atheist Conference last year, is we need to take back the idea of intelligent design. We need intelligent design 
intelligent design of our morals, intelligent design of our ethics, intelligent design of our society. We need to sit down together as rational beings, scientific beings, and decide, talk about, discuss, argue about, wonder about the sort of society in which we want to live, the sort of morals we want to obey, the sort of ethics uh, we want to uphold. Intelligently design that uh, rather than get it from some Bronze Age barbaric text. Um, I think that anybody who actually reads the Bible or the Quran would be totally horrified at the thought that anybody could get their morals from there. So we've got to get it from somewhere else, and we clearly do get it from somewhere else, because if you look at the social mores, the ethics, the morals that people have over historical time, they are labeled by the time in which they are talked about, not, by the, not so much by the uh, religious background of the people talking. When we today, whether we're religious or not, are 21st century citizens, and our morals and our ethics and our, our views of how to live are 21st century views. Some are a bit ahead of the curve, some are a bit, a bit behind, but we are, however far ahead or behind the 21st century curve we are, we are unmistakably all 21st century people, different from 19th century or, or 16th century people. Um, if you look at the 19th century, even people in the vanguard of moral and political thought, like T.H. Huxley, like Charles Darwin, uh, Abraham Lincoln, their views today would shock us. They're racist, they're non-progressive, they're sexist. Um, we have moved on, we've all moved on. So that there is something, I've called it the shifting moral zeitgeist, there's something that moves on from century to century, and it owes nothing or almost nothing to religion. So clearly we're getting it from somewhere else. And it seems to me that we should try to intelligently design where it comes from and uh, write down what it is that, we've, that we feel is, is right and, and what we feel is wrong. It doesn't come from scripture. It doesn't or shouldn't come from fear of punishment uh, and hope of reward. It should come from an honest, altruistic, socially conscious discussion of the kind of society in which we all feel we would like to live. For many years, even as a Christian, I, tr I struggled to reconcile the stuff I was taught, the, the way in the media one is bombarded with evolution is a fact, isn't it? And it's taken me a long time to unlearn that, and you may think that's going completely in the wrong direction, but there was a time when I believed what you believed. And I'm not sure there's a time when you believe what you, you will be, I, I mean, one day I hope you'll believe what I believe in terms of the existence of a personal God. But on the other hand, the mounting evidence that things are younger than they seem. Well, I mean, maybe one of these days I'll have a deathbed conversion and believe in some sort of personal God, but I sure as hell won't believe the world's only 6,000 years old. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Uh, well, I'm not sure it is, but there, is, there are studies on the internet that, that are available. Uh, from websites that you probably wouldn't like, like uh, AnswersInGenesis.org. Um, but they purport to show that the Earth cannot be more than, say, 10,000 years old. See, it sounds awfully like special pleading. I mean, wh what it sounds to me is, is that you've, you've decided for scriptural reasons that this, this is what you believe, and then you desperately go around looking for side. something to fit it, and, and you find something on some odd website somewhere. And, and, but you don't look at the, at the whole corpus of the evidence. But I've looked at that for years. I, I, think, I think you're right that is a criticism of the way I teach, but should children have the right to decide on these things? That's my point. Everybody I, has the right to decide I'm on not everything. anti- yeah. And yes, in the end, it was a personal revelation, but only a revelation because I was, I was inquiring, is there a God? And I did that as many people have done over the generations. Did the Jesus Christ rise from the dead? What, was the, what is the evidence, historical evidence? for the resurrection of Christ, and I came to this. It wasn't logic in the end, it was faith. But and once again, trust. Uh, um, the bishops and vicars would agree about Christ. They would not uh, agree with you about the age of the earth. I think we're not going to agree about that. Let's just say thank you very much. <laughs> thank right. you, Professor. Yeah. Until they get to that age, it's the parents' responsibility. And do duty. you teach them that you may not share should that. be punished? You may not share that, but that is my religion. That is the way I've been brought up, and I have 
I bring that child into this world, I educate him, I give him everything, it's my right to make sure that I bring him, and I, I take issue with that. You think that it's wicked, well that's your point of view. I know that's going to make him a better human being, and what's missing is when you talk about faith, you don't look at what faith teaches. First and foremost, what faith teaches is that, listen, you're a human being, so respect your fellow human beings. And I think that's an important point that you don't want to discuss. What is the penalty for apostasy? that is the thing that you fail to discuss, and that's why you've got those prejudicial views about faith. With what respect. is the penalty for apostasy? What do you teach the children will happen to them if they give up the Muslim faith? Well, let's bring Can the I... debate back into Britain. What is the penalty for apostasy? But what is the penalty for apostasy? What is the penalty for leaving the Muslim faith? Um, to be honest, I cannot back that point up. Dr. Dr. Mukadam, what is the penalty for apostasy? And, well, um, before... Yeah, we well, keep coming down this apostasy. Well, well, give us a quick answer on what is the penalty for apostasy. Country, country, you Sorry? very well know, if it's an Islamic country, then the Sharia is very clear. Apostasy, apostasy is dealt with the death penalty. Thank you, that's all I want to Which God and subsequent argument have you encountered that you find the most challenging to refute? I think literally none. Um, <laughs> you, you, you are saying that there are parts of the Bible which you find reasonable and other parts which I'm saying don't. there are parts of, of religious traditions, whatever they religious might traditions. be, that ha parts, and, and texts. Okay, that there are the parts that you find reasonable and parts that you, that you don't, and sure. that, that's right. Why bother to bring it back to religion? If you've got an independent criterion for deciding which bits of religion you find reasonable and which you don't, just decide. Don't bother to go... <laughs> Cut out the middleman of, re of, of religion and just go straight to, to your modern, decent, liberal understanding of what's right and wrong. And that doesn't come from the Bible, or if it does, it's a pure incidental accident. But, yeah. And do you think at some point in our lives we will not be a religious society? Yes, I think I do think that. Uh, it may take a while. Um, it's, we're moving in the right direction, in, certainly in Europe, and I think also in America, actually. I mean, the number, of, the number of people who profess no religion in America has now exceeded 20%. That's a fifth. That's quite a large percentage. It's a percentage that hasn't been really recognized politically, but it's there. Uh, in, in Europe, it's much higher, most of Europe. I mean, not all, not, not, not Poland, for example, but in Britain and Scandinavia and Holland and so on, it's, it is. And a lot of that may actually have been because of you and your book, The God Delusion. Wouldn't it be nice <laughs> to think that? I, I wouldn't <laughs> dare say that myself. Thank you. I, I, I'm baffled by the way sophisticated theologians who know perfectly well Adam and Eve never existed still carry on talking about it as though it had some profound wisdom to impart to us um, in an allegorical sense, or, or, I mean, that I presume is what you, what you mean. Pretty much. It's, again, something which isn't just a 21st century invention, but some...